uh, an ACT championship, Priest is a little bit weak because in a reactive deck like Priest, being able to play around the removal you know is in their deck, or being able to play around the combos that you know is in their deck, is a possibility. But going into a format like this, yeah, you honestly have no idea, which makes the deck stronger. And I think that's why Priest is in a better situation on ladder and in blind tournaments like this than it is in tournaments where you know what your opponent's going to bring. It often means that we as casters, too, when we see like the opening mulligans, it's oftentimes very difficult uh, to know exactly what yeah. the deck is. But uh, Pimping Ho doing us a favor here with the double purify silence, we can certainly draw some conclusions. I think it's Miracle Priest. You think so? I'm thinking Dragon Priest. Yeah, that's yeah. one of the two. Mm. Uh, one of the two. We'll have to see how this game goes on. Hopefully he'll draw a card <laughs> that will let us know. Uh, maybe with the Purified, that'll let us know what kind of uh, deck this is. But Dang. Dog, that could be anything. Yeah. I was going to say, if you at home know what Pimping Ho is playing, tweet us. Let us know just what you think it might be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, dog, though... Uh, is a fan of Curious Glimmer. This is Curious Glimmer. It's an interesting card to me because there are some pro players who just absolutely swear by it. And Dog is one of those people who's been very much defending the card for a long time now. It's a little bit of an awkward card in Arena. I actually drafted a preset the other day that had three cu Curious Glimmer roots. And in my game, you actually came over and were watching me play that deck a little bit, I think, the other day. And during that run, I got zero out of five Curious Glimmer roots right. Yeah, it's harder in Arena. It's very difficult in Arena. All right. Meanwhile, Pimping Ho, we see there from the Mulligan. You know, I think we know a little bit more. You know, it's hard to just exactly mm -hmm. say what it is, but uh, we have a little more information there. We have two minions that cannot attack unless they are silenced. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that gives us definitely some information there. All right. So looking at this matchup in general, you, you kind of got to go on the, the beatdown plan as the, as the Silence Breeze because you'll run out of gas. You can't play around too many things, but to be honest, you don't really need to. Yeah. Ancient Watcher and the Humongous Razor Leaf both are at that uh, four attack, and uh, since we uh, ha have not seen a Power Word 4 uh, <laughs> released for Priest yet, they will struggle to deal with four attack minions. I like that he'd be like Shadow Word 4. Shadow Word 4 would be the name of that spell if it ever came out, not Power Word 4. As you said, You're though, absolutely right, Rob. Yeah, you are 100% you. correct. Yep. Well, the United States. <laughs> Getting a call? <laughs> What's that? Uh. All right, well, somebody answered the call. We see their dog went ahead and put out the North Shard Cleric. Gonna have the option to play down the second one. Uh, Pimping Ho can get down that Ancient Watcher on the next turn and then just use that Shadow Vision to potentially dig for a silent. Don't worry, TJ. I'm going to keep going. Hello. Yes, this is Dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That one just writes itself. It really does. Yeah. Uh, Dog deciding whether or not he wants to go ahead and get that second Norshire Cleric down now. There's nothing quite uh, going on the board yet for Pimping Ho, so there's nothing for those Norshire Clerics to bash into and get damaged. <laughs> Are you still on the Skype call? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Well, uh, I think Dog, I, I was going to say, before we were rudely interrupted, uh, they thought a while for that Turbo Northshire Cleric play because against some types of some decks, you want to save the Northshire Cleric to be able to get the guaranteed draw. Yeah. But they realized that against a lot of Priest decks, you really just want to have the minion on board because it sort of uh, not denies their Northshire Cleric, but it forces them to basically make that conscious decision by playing their own. That's if you draw, then I'm going to draw. But does my deck benefit from draw more than yours does? Makes it a little bit of an awkward situation. All right, well, we see Dog got it correct. He figured out that the Radiant Elemental was in there. Curious Glimmer, outside of Arena, is generally much more consistent, which is... Uh, <laughs> generally. Generally much more consistent. Mm. Yeah. Well, Shadow Visions can uh, pick up a Silence here for this Humongous Razor Leaf. They could also just p play the Ancient Watcher to uh, create some, wait for it, board tension. You're not Nathan Zamora. Don't you I talk must. about board tension. No, I am not allowed to talk about board tension. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, uh, it looks like he is going to go ahead and use that Shadow Visions, though. Dig for something here. Silence uh, could be played immediately. The Purify doesn't quite have the mana for. Power Shield is interesting because you you are obviously able to draw a card, and it does buff the minion. But since you would have to silence the Humongous Razor Leaf before you even play it, you kind of lose out on the, the actual buff aspect of it. Yeah, I think uh, Purify is definitely the correct choice there. Uh, based on multiple things. Uh, yeah. One, it draws a card. And mm -hmm. two, it silences your minion. Those are two really good things for you. 
Usually. Power Shield only does one of those things. Now, let's uh, take a, a step back and say, for instance, uh, you draw the Pure Five, but you don't have the Humongous Razor Leaf on board. Then all of a sudden, you can draw a card, but the Silencing Your Minion actually has a negative effect. So, Rob, in those types of situations, it's usually better to have a different card other than Purify, but in this situation, it's definitely a good thing. All right, well, thank you for the lesson. <laughs> I feel like we, we have all learned a lot from you, Tej. Uh, meanwhile, the decision was made to go ahead and Potion of Madness, one Northshire Cleric, uh, put it into the Curious Glimmer Root. So mm -hmm. this is an interesting thing because you are consciously choosing then to damage the Curious Glimmer Root and allow Dog, if he wants to, to invest the mana, invest the tempo to draw a card, uh, but you're basically limiting and say, I'll give you one card. And next turn, you know you're going into the ability to silence the Razor Leaf. Yeah. The one thing of what you can do with this deck is you can sort of get into a position where you're you're building up cards to go for essentially what's a one-turn kill. Uh, because a lot of times, by buffing up your minion too early on in the game, you're letting the priest have the ability to remove it. The Humongous Razor Leaf, that thing is probably not going to get killed anytime soon. You can keep it where it is and hopefully get to the point where you can just keep killing your opponent's stuff and get to the point where eventually you'll draw enough cards to go for that one-turn kill. It's not like Druid where you literally just want to make the biggest thing possible and kill them as quick as possible. You want to make sure that you have the resources necessary to go for that push when you sense the weakness from your from your priest opponent. Uh, but it can get quite difficult because if you do go in too early, you can get to the point where your opponent uh, playing, you know, the more uh, control style of priest will run you out of resources because right. there's only a few cards in your deck that actually do something <laughs> when just played onto the board. So uh, it, it can get really tough because control priest can definitely play an attrition style game if you play this deck the wrong way as a silence priest. Yeah, and Pimigo has a couple of options in terms of how he wants to approach this turn. Uh, decides to just go ahead and get the Purify, get that card draw, get a little bit more information, allow the humongous raise away from TJ. You look like you just had a, a great, great thought as that Divine Spirit uh, came out. I did. That Divine Spirit is lit. Yeah? It goes along with their very game plan of just keeping this humongous Razor Leaf alive, but not going all in on it. And I, I could imagine that they can use this Divine Spirit on the humongous Razor Leaf, but hold off on the Interfire for quite a long time yeah. until they know that that humongous Razor Leaf is getting in for a humongous amount of damage. And right now, I don't think 16 is humongous enough. It needs to be humongous er. Yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah, uh, to your point earlier, it's yeah you can buff the health of this, and then you're you're allowing the uh, opposing priest to potentially have a silence if, mm -hmm. if that might just be like a, a random one-off thing that's in there. You're allowing dog the opportunity to to interact with your humongous razor leaf, but uh, the reality is is since that minion still has four attack, it's actually just very difficult to do anything meaningful to, even if you take the health off of it. And in the meantime, that humongous razor leaf, while not humongous enough to end the game, is humongous enough to patrol the board. There's a couple of things that could be a possibility for the United States, and those things are if they're playing pint-sized potion. We yeah. saw uh, Sequinox. Highly unlikely, though. Highly unlikely. If you're not Singapore, it's actually very unlikely that you run that. Yeah. Uh, the deck has potential, but it's very very reactive and you have to basically pinpoint your opponent on playing you know a few things uh and i just don't think uh, if you knew that they were playing silence burst maybe because you can get a lot of work done you can steal their big boy with uh uh don't steal the big boy with cabal shadow priest you can pine size potion and then shadow word pain also united states could pick up say their own inner fire if they have it in their deck and use that in combination with shadow word death they had it in the mulligans but they threw it away so I don't know if they have a if it's a a one of or if they're just not drawing it. We know that it's not the uh, singleton priest, the Highlander priest, Kazakas priest, whatever you want to call it, uh, Raza the Unchained priest, <laughs> as it's most popularly known as, <laughs> uh, because they drew two Dragonfire potions. Unless they're playing a Raza the Unchained priest with double Dragonfire potion, doesn't seem very smart to me. Probably not. Probably not, not a little bit of anti synergy there. I uh, want to point out, Dog did something pretty clever there. He went ahead and put the Priest of the Feast into the Humongous Razor Leaf, realizing that if Pimping Ho had another Divine Spirit and then the Inner Fire, that would just be game. Yeah. So it goes ahead and brings it down to a little bit more manageable level where you're saying to Pimping Ho, okay, you, now you need to have Circle of, Heal Circle of Healing, Divine Spirit, and Inner Fire mm -hmm. to win the game. So I like that from Dog. Yeah, this is a really tough spot for Taiwan, though. Again, they don't, they're not in a position where they want to use the Inner Fire yet to make it vulnerable to Shadow or Death. If they play out the Acolyte of Pain, they're basically conceding the fact that they'll only get one draw from it. 
Uh, I think Ancient Watcher is just the best plan here. Either it'll absorb damage or they'll be able to silence it next turn. What do you think about maybe just using that Circle of Healing to bring the Razor Leaf back up to a higher total? Obviously, at this point, yeah. it is one damage away from being cleared just on the board, and your opponent appears to be playing a style of Priest that has the potential for Holy Nova Dragonfire potions. Yeah, you're going into turn six as well, and you've seen, but you, you have seen that United States has had plays each turn. It's not like they've just been passing their turns over. You know, they sure. went with the, they had uh, the Priest of the Feast on four, they had Elise on five. So you can't quite pin them on having Dragonfire Potion. You've seen one card dead in their hand for a while. But you, you with a Priest deck like this, you, you literally can't pin it on having anything. And actually, United States is going to pass in the opportunity here. They could have had a full board clear. Yeah. Which is oftentimes actually really appealing against a Silence Priest deck. Because like I said before, they have a very limited amount of, of actual threats in the deck. They have double Ancient Watcher and double Humongous Razor Leaf, which are the two sort of heavy lifters. Yeah. Outside of that, their win condition revolves around like sticking an Acolyte of Pain or a Northshire Clerk on board and buffing that up enough to be able to win. Or using Potion of Madness on, say, a Radiant Elemental or your opponent's Northshire Cleric in order to go for a kill that way. But if you just keep killing off their stuff, there's really not many ways for them to win at all, build up a board big enough to be able to kill you. But they're being very patient with this Dragonfire Potion, and I can imagine it's still going to pay off, given the fact that Taiwan didn't really go for anything last turn. But yeah, in the meantime, or in the meanwhile, Taiwan's just going to go ahead and pull the trigger on this Lyra. Just go ahead and see what they can start generating now. Oh, that is Mind Vision. Statistically likely to show them the Dragonfire Potion, which is not what they want to see. They no. want to be the aggressors here. But they will be happy to have that information because then they can start playing around the, the uh, Dragonfire Potion of the United States, but... I mean, uh, at that point, though, I think you kind of have to assume that something like that is in there anyway. I mean, what do you... What, is the information you're getting really necessarily that beneficial? Like, you probably have to assume there's Dragonfire Potion in this deck anyway. Yeah, that's true. I like just cycling the silence here. You have enough silence to affect your hands already. You'd much rather try and find uh, something else uh, to sort of fill that void of, of buffers. Another circle of healing off this would have been huge. Don't get that. They do get a Shadow Visions, which is still pretty good. Allow them to dig into the deck and find potentially more of those silence effects. But I think what they're looking for right now is just the the ability to stick a big minion and get that another Divine Spirit off on it. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll most likely see a Dragonfire Potion. Actually, we will almost 100% see a Dragonfire Potion here. Don't see any other plays. And uh, say goodbye to your board, Taiwan. Pimpingho asking where it all went wrong. Yeah, and I mean, he, here it is again. No minions in the hand besides Acolyte of Pain. Acolyte of Pain doesn't really have great synergy with, with Purify. And right now, they could just put it on board and inner fire it, which doesn't <laughs> seem great. But Dragon and Operative they is get a pit not... Fighter. <laughs> they get a Pit Fighter that also has the Dragon uh, tag on it, which means it is uh, not susceptible to Dragonfire Potion. And it's just a 5-6. <laughs> Hey, look, it's a pit fighter. Just imagine if that pit fighter had a dragon tag on it. If it just, its key, if its keyword said dragon. You know, for a moment when the Twilight Drake came out and the pit fighter was still there, it actually like just kind of lined up. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a, an important point to note that uh, dragon fire, or not dragon fire, sorry, dragon operative does uh, not take damage from dragon fire potion. That could be something that is fairly big in the mm -hmm. coming turns, but uh, the fact that it's five attack just means that. Taiwan is aware that there's a good chance that Dog and the USA team can interact with it whenever they want. That's a tough choice, actually. Divine Spirit is pretty enticing because they just drew their Twilight Drake, so they can make their own giant Vortex minion. That's really hard to remove. They've seen one of the natural silences from the deck, and that's like the way you deal with Twilight Drake as a silence priest. Um, there's still one more natural silence, I believe, because the second silence was from uh, the Lyra. Uh, face of Shambler, they could, you know, diversify their assets, uh, expand their portfolio, sure. their their dragon uh, mutual funds. I mean, Amnesiac might be a little young to to be starting to think about those things, but Dog is at a good age now, where I think, given how popular he is as a streamer, yeah. he is going to really want to start to uh, do some of those things you said. Yeah, and in fact, he probably already has. But I, I like to tell this story uh, when Amnesiac won the Winter Championship of 2016. Uh, he was even younger than he is now. 
That's um, that's actually just true. <laughs> it was. Uh, he was younger in a lot of things. Demeanor, uh, his his shoe favorability. He was uh, less savage on Twitter. He was less savage. He was actually not savage at all back then. He and was just young. It, during the final match against Nassim, I was sitting next to his mom, and his mom was super nervous. And I asked her, I said, do you understand the game? Like, why are you nervous? She's like, I don't understand anything about the game. She said, I just really hope he wins because I really want to shed. <laughs> I said, "What? How is that relevant?" She said, "Well, if he wins, I- I'm gonna buy myself a shed with this prize money." I do remember this uh, conversation from uh, Mom Nijak. Yeah, it was. It, I, I laughed quite a bit because if you're not 18 yet, the prize money goes to your parents. But I talked to Andy Jack. She said they put the money aside for him. She didn't buy a shed. She took one for the team, Team USA. What a good mom. All right. Well, the buff's going to come out onto the Dragon and Operative, and Pimping Ho and Taiwan realizing, okay. This is not the way we wanted to play this deck. This is not how we wanted to proceed, but kind of have to make the best of a bad situation here and commit resources onto this Draken operative. And uh, they realize Shadow or Death here is particularly UC. It is UC. But the Draken operative would have already been vulnerable to the Shadow or Death. Right. So they realize that they can just you know go in on it just because of the fact that it would die to Shadow or Death anyway. So they might as well just make it more powerful. Oh, yeah. and, well, uh, and I think they, they have to, right? They have to get something going at this yeah. point where they can actually be be the aggressor again. They're, you know, they're they're ahead in terms of resources invested this game, and they understand mm. that their opponent's deck more than likely just scales better mm -hmm. in the late game. Now, Rob, what we saw there was an interesting line of play. The United States went for a purify on their on their uh, Radiant Elemental. Now, this seems a little bit unintuitive because Radiant Elemental has an effect that's usually really good in Priest by reducing the cost of your spells by one. That is weird. Why would they do that, Tej? Well, I'll inform you. Okay. They did this because they really didn't like how their hand looked. They didn't like the texture of their hand. <laughs> so instead, they decided to go for... Uh, the purify on it just to try and get that extra draw. They realized that they could use all the spells in their hand even with the mana total that they had. So they were willing to give up the powerful effect of the rated on the mental to see what the next draw on their deck was. That's kind of nuts, frankly, that they, they realized that, you know, that beneficial effect wasn't particularly useful to them at that point, but drawing a card and changing the texture of their hand would be. It's one of the important facets of Hearthstone. <sighs> These people are so good. They are. All right, face the Shambler. Actually, a really good pickup here. It's going to meet a short end because of the Cabal Song Stealer in the hand of the United States. But uh, for Taiwan, it feels pretty good to to sort of get another big threat online, especially considering they passed the Shadow or Death check two turns in a row. Yeah. If Shadow or Death was there, Taiwan feels pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. They would have seen it by now. Still Unfortunately, need to still need to find a way to deal with this. Don't mean to interrupt you, Rob. I'm I know it's so okay. Sorry. I'm done. You go ahead. <laughs> You're the, you're the big man on the desk here, Tej. I'm used to being the tallest one on the desk when Core is here, but, you know, it's not me today. You have the power. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big man, but I have a small personality. I got nothing for you. I, that, I don't know how to comment on that one. All right, so Song Stealer would allow them to make that Faceless Shambler a 1-1. You know those identity crises that people have where they feel like there's someone else on the inside? <laughs> <laughs> well... Teach, you're not even 30 yet. You can't be doing this. When I when I went through like a couple of my growth spurts when I was younger, it felt really weird to me because I felt like I was a short person on the inside. You ever get that feeling? Uh, well, I'm a short person on the outside and also the inside, so I I've actually self-actualized pretty pretty reasonably. Okay. Yeah. So now you're just like one of those big pit bulls that thinks it's like a, a small little dog. Mm -hmm. You get yeah. scared of everything. Yeah. Like a, a husky that thinks it's a lap dog. You are certainly husky. Uh, we see the board, though. For USA, pretty husky itself. Pretty wide. Pretty thick. So, yeah, it's asking the question, Taiwan, can you deal with this? And uh, Taiwan does have the Holy Nova. They got off the Lyra, but it's not going to be uh, as impactful as they need it to be. Sort of the question that I ask every casting desk that I'm a part of. Can you deal with this? <laughs> Do you have the Shadow of Death? No, I, 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 you know what? I don't. I do not have the shadow or death to you, Mountain Giant. <laughs> we've been, I, I don't think we've cast together since like 2015, and I'm starting to see why, Deej. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. <laughs> well, I doubt Taiwan's going to go for a purify on their own Radiant Elemental yet. What about the texture of their hand? The texture of their hand is actually really bad right now. It's like sandpaper. 
Mm, uncomfortable. Actually, they could go for the Purify. I think Purify and Radial Elemental here is actually uh, better than purifying the Draconid Operative. Draconid Operative is just going to reduce the power. But really here, they're just going to take the time to try and develop Purify afterwards. That way, you know, they expend... Uh, they get the much mana efficiency as possible because they used it before and then realize that they want a holy nova anyway. Then they don't have uh, don't have the the mana remaining to do much else. All right, well, able to get that lesser healing off at the buzzer, so it did go Ooh. through. And they do reduce the power on the board, so Taiwan really just trying to stick in this one, yeah. even though USA did a really good job of contesting the board early into the Dragonfire potion. Yeah. So here they could just trade in and drop the Primordial Drake just as a 4-8. The effect really is pretty uh, useless here because they would have to trade both their minions into the Draconid Operative anyway. And then they would have to Shadow or Pain the Radio Elemental. So, but I think that's good. Yeah, 4-8 is just such a troublesome stat line anyway. And honestly, Taiwan, as we said, needs to be the aggressor here. And mm -hmm. if they're not being the aggressor, then over time, Dog and the USA are just going to win this one. Yeah. So I definitely like the Primordial or Primordial Drake here. Trying to think, maybe they can hold off for another turn. I was gonna say, Dragonfire Potion doesn't obviously doesn't look appealing because the Primordial or not the Primordial Drake, the Dragon Operative is a dragon. So uh, the Pit Fighter. Yeah. All right, so just a four eight on the board. That's a dragon. Uh, Pimping Ho and crew cannot deal with that. Ugh. Starting to get to that point where you just look at Silence Priest and think, wow. That's all you think? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just think, wow. That's what I call Silence Priest. It's a deck that has very polarized matchups. Uh, for example, if the Silence Priest were to match up against Jade Druid, it has an incredibly favorable matchup against Jade Druid because if they get one big minion down and are able to silence it, they can end the game within just a few turns because Jade Druid struggles to deal with these big minions. But against a Control Priest, they have to get to a point where they're finding this balance between, you know, buffing, not buffing their minions to make them vulnerable to shadow or death, uh, but making sure that they try and draw enough cards to get to the point where they can, you know, reasonably kill their opponent. And we saw that exact situation here where Taiwan was afraid to all in on their minions, but eventually they played it sl just slow enough to where uh, the U.S. was able to remove their minions anyway. So it's a tough balance to find. and. Now it's just going to be, again, that attrition style that we talked about where each draw from Taiwan's deck doesn't do anything by itself. It needs the combo with other cards, whereas uh, the United States with Control Priest, while it is reactive, uh, it, it will find things that it can just play on an empty board. Like Priest of the Feast. Yeah, this matchup can go differently for uh, the Silence Priest there. In, in better circumstances, but again, USA did a, a great job of just crowding the board early and keeping the health totals of the minions, yeah. which are usually pretty high, uh, at a reasonable point where they could just line up a perfect Dragonfire Potion turn. And from that point on, it is just extremely difficult for Taiwan to get back on the board, mm -hmm. even with uh, you know their, their premium minions having four attack, which is usually just so strong against Priest. And these are not the type of turns that win you the game, but uh, to your point, these cards are not very strong. What do you do, Pyromancer? <laughs> Faceless Shambler? It's great analysis, Rob. Thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm usually, this may surprise you, I'm actually not the analysis guy on the desk, generally. Me neither. A lot of weeks, uh, this desk actually has no analysis person. Just like it does this week. <laughs> Nothing changed. Yeah, just drawing uh, weak pieces there. I don't Pimping know what Ho. they could expect. They've used both uh, yeah. Humongous Rage Leafs. They have a Northshire Cleric left in their deck. They have an, an Aisha Watcher left in their deck, none of which will do much good on an empty board just playing it down. You need multiple things to be able to do it. If they did draw, like, Accolade of Pain, which they do, they can start drawing cards, but it's much too late at this point. Yeah, I mean, they can drop the Pyromancer, or they can drop the Acolyte and, and just start looking, but there's really nothing they're going to find in their deck yeah. that's going to get them out of this one. They can draw a few cards here. We'll see if anything changes, but it just doesn't feel like they have any cards in their deck that are going to change the landscape of this board. Let's see. Nope. Ready Elemental. No. They can inner fire, but not even going to do it. I don't think there was a single card in their deck that would have saved them. And United States off to a, a great start. 
Yeah, and again, as a reminder, if you're just tuning in, the winner of this match uh, advances to the top eight next week. Mm -hmm. uh, the loser is done. They are out of the Hearthstone Global game. So it's been a long road and to get to this point and fall short. Certainly, uh, frankly, would suck. Yeah, I mean, they can't take solace in the fact that, hey, there was a giant field of countries. We made yeah. it to the knockout stage in the top 16. Out of all the countries participating, all 48, we were able to, you know, be well into the top half. But that's not nearly as, as, as sweet. <laughs> as uh, making it to the live finals, which is, you know, definitely the goal of all these teams, especially right. some of the smaller countries that are still left. Making it to the live finals would give them, for a lot of those players, their first offline, big stakes, Hearthstone tournament experience. And uh, being able to do it while representing their country probably has to be a pretty cool feeling. I think for for all of the for all of the teams here, that is the name of the game, is getting there and just, you know, being able to say years from now, hey, Inaugural Hearthstone Global Game season, we made it to that live finals. Uh, we, we, you could even say we won, right? And mm. that regional pride is a big factor. Let's go ahead and take a look at the score as far, though. As we mentioned, currently 1-0 in favor of the United States, getting that all-important win with the pre-stack. Next up, it is going to be HQ Roger taking on Firebat. And it's going to be Shaman versus Paladin. Now, a week ago, I would have told you there's only really one successful style of Shaman. The other types uh, get played with, but they, they don't really accomplish much. But... Mm. Uh, in the wake of the changes to Jade Elemental, actually, the suddenly getting the Elemental tag, a lot of people are actually uh, experimenting again with the type. Yeah. Uh, in the past, there was a, a severe lack of strong board drop Elementals. Fireplume Phoenix was really the only one, and that was sort of fringe yeah. uh, playable for, for the Elemental Shaman deck, which really wasn't a deck at all. Um, and so, you know, ha being able to have something that is a pretty strong four drop that benefits your Jade package, which you already play anyway in most Shaman decks just because it's Jade Lightning and uh, Jade Claws are cards you play anyway almost. Um, it really helped the deck, I think. And you can experiment with other things as well. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen people do like the Jade Shaman deck that, that we, you know, saw be popular at the very beginning of Global Games and... You know, even through other tournaments, but you just put in a couple of elementals to sort of fit the try and fit the curve a little bit better, like Kalamos, which has a strong yeah. effect regardless of the deck you're playing in, or uh, Servant of Kalamos, which is a lot of time gets you more Jade Spirits, and then you can Spirit Echo them, do all that stuff. So I, I like that version of the deck. I don't like the full elemental deck yet, right. uh, or full elemental with some Jade. I like the full Jade with some elemental. Well, it's uh, it's certainly interesting that again we're we're kind of late into the journey to Angoro meta, but the the very slight changes made now have kind of got the deck builders back to the drawing board, and they're thinking, okay, what are the kind of cool things we could do? Is this better than Bloodlust Shaman? Yeah. And the reality is, Bloodlust Shaman is an extremely consistent deck for what it is. You know, it's there's a reason it has kind of risen up the ranks and become one of those powerhouse decks yeah. uh, late into Journey to Angoro. But it's cool to see uh, more iteration and seeing if maybe some of that sticks. One of the funny things was that. People watch the matches at the recent HTT Spring Championship in Shanghai, and they're like, "Wow, it looks like Shaman is doing pretty poorly. <laughs> it's drawing patches a lot. It's you know getting blown out of the game a lot. Um, it's being it's susceptible to really bad draws, but it still had you know pretty far above a 50% win rate. Right. And three of the four players in the top four brought that deck to the tournament. So it feels like sometimes it it is hard to piece together wins, but then at other times it feels like the deck can't be beat. And if you look at its matchups across the board, it only has a couple of bad matchups. Right, that's, that's kind of the important yeah. point is that from a tournament perspective, it doesn't actually have like really that many bad matchups. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's go ahead and take a look at the bracket now and see where we stand in the top 16 currently. Again, we had a bunch of matches taking place on Tuesday in our Poland studio. We are rounding out the last of them for the top 16. Uh, as you can see there, teams that have already made it to the top eight, China and Czech Republic, certainly two teams that uh, I am not surprised to see in the mm -hmm. top eight. I don't know about you, they, these were two teams that I think were, were earmarked for glory. China was a funny team to watch throughout the Global Games because there were some weeks where it felt like they were in like full meme mode. They were just <laughs> joking around, not really playing 100%. And they lost those weeks, uh, obviously, because of their demeanor. But then the weeks that they decided to turn it on, yeah. in the weeks where they were playing from separate locations and they couldn't get caught up in all that, that, all that fun, you know, all that gross fun. <laughs> Uh, they, they ended up winning, and, you know, they're one of the teams that has probably the most successful lineup of players. If you look at just you know, their results domestically in China, all four players on that team have won a ton of events. Right. Each individual has won a ton of events, so it's it's hard to sort of count them out at any stage, even when they're 
fooling around or doing whatever it is that they were doing in some of those early weeks. Just fooling around. Yeah. Yeah. We saw Mexico up there as well, and they, like New Zealand's, was kind of this uh, cool Cinderella story coming into it. They're now at the point where next week they're going to be playing against South Korea, which is going to be a huge test mm-hmm. of just truly how great that team can be. But, uh, yeah, we are we are seeing our top eight take shape. Obviously, after tonight, we will know the next two teams advancing, but... Uh, we're currently just waiting on players to get ready for the next game. We'll be hopping in there shortly. Uh, you know, some of the teams, we talked about that, that a lot of the really good teams that people were expecting didn't make it through. There are also ones that did not. You know, you think about, like, Germany, Russia. Mm-hmm. These are two teams, again, that were expected to, you know, just based on the strength of roster, make it through, uh, but struggled. So there was there was room for teams to kind of come in that nobody knew and put on a good performance, put in the work, and uh, advance themselves. But there were also some teams who maybe... Uh, didn't necessarily put in as much work, and we yeah. saw them suffer for it. I think the European teams in general, uh, a lot of them, I, I don't want to say underperform because a lot of them did perform. They just didn't quite make the cut. Yeah. They didn't perform well enough um, compared to what most people expect from Europe. Europe is has been the most dominating region in Hearthstone since the very beginning with a, a slight... Mm, we had two world champions before two, Europe. Two so. world champions in a... Sh- Two world champions in a row. The two inaugural world champions, mind you. Uh, you know, Firebat dominated Hearthstone in 2014 and in early 2015 with back-to-back tournament wins at Gfinity. Uh, but since then, Europe has, yeah, has pretty much dominated. And you know, there was a lot of teams that made it through the group stages that had incredible performances that just fell short in phase two or at the beginning of phase three. I think Italy was a big team. Yeah. Yeah. They were, you know, the top performing team from phase one and they just kind of sort of went downhill from there. Uh, and it's, you know, kind of a bummer for them because they're all on the same team outside of HGG as well. Uh, and you could tell they put in a lot of work and, uh, for, for them to fall short early, but I think there's big things in the future for them. Maybe a season two of global games. Should there be one? Yeah, and you talk about Europe's dominance. Obviously, we both just came back from the Spring Championship, and, and there we saw just firsthand the the top four from the Spring Championship, three European players, and then you know the the last great American hope ant, obviously. But uh, Europe continues to to as you said be a powerhouse in competitive Hearthstone, and uh, that is translated obviously very handily to the Hearthstone Global Games. So, Rob, what decks you've been playing on ladder recently? Uh, Big Druid. Big Druid and Abar's uh, Hunter list that tops out at a three mana curve. Tops out at three. Yep. Really nice. What about you, Teej? I'm playing all sorts of stuff. Yeah. I have taken a, sort of a leaf out of Amnesiac's book, but playing a lot of Arena. Are you an Arena specialist now? I would say that I am an Arena specialist. So you, you queue into Standard, and you just like don't know what's going on anymore? I, Are I, you scared? I honestly don't. Yeah. I, I fear a little bit. <laughs> I say I see a, a Vicious Fledgling place under the board, and I forget about all the removal that I have in my deck, <laughs> and I concede instantly. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, don't you see a lot of that in Arena, too? No, that's what I'm saying. Like oh, okay, because yeah, of yeah. my adventures in arena, you are now just have that much more fear of mm-hmm. vicious fudging. Which these days, I mean, you mostly see an aggro druid, but you also occasionally see a hunter. Sometimes, yeah. You, you, you how master that bad boy fits the curve. That just lines up. Three how do you four? deal with it? You don't even need to give it taunt anymore because it already has taunt. You can just choose the wind fairy without having to worry about the taunt. <laughs> yeah, you can. It's. It's definitely a case, but we saw the classes coming up next. I believe it was uh, Shaman and Paladin. Yeah. Um, Paladin is very powerful. Starts with a P, yeah. Paladin powerful. No one deck should have all that power. A little bit of uh, alliteration. The powerful Paladin gave a, a pat, pat on, on the that. pancreas. <laughs> That's a thing you can do. But as you said, uh, Firebout will be on that Paladin deck. Obviously, guys... As much as we enjoy regaling you with Talkstone, we are just mostly giving the players time uh, to queue up. But Paladin is a deck that's uh, a lot of uh, iteration in the early weeks of Journey to Angoro and kind of settled at a point where there was, there was a standard variation. There was a more control-heavy uh, variation. Then we started seeing the curve lighten up, and that was the more aggro version. Just recently, things have mostly settled, uh, with the exception of Yambre emerging from his cave, as he sometimes does, and being like, well, I hit number one legend with this Paladin deck, and mm-hmm. I'll see you guys in a year. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who I, who play World of Warcraft alongside Hearthstone, I like to um, equate Jambre. You're not going to know this reference, so just nod and smile because uh, you don't play World of Warcraft. Or do you? Who knows? We'll see if you get the reference. Jambre is like Wither Jim, okay? Wither Jim is in the weekly world boss rotation. He only shows up, you know, once every like eight weeks, but he's got the most powerful loot out of all the world bosses. And when he shows up, you need an entire party of adventurers to kill him. And he's in a cave, and he only emerges every once in a while. But when he does, 
you pay attention. I I did actually go do that world quest one week back when I was with the gym. Routinely doing the world quest. He's in a cave, right? You just have to go. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So He's, that's Jambray. He's the World of Warcraft equivalent of Wither Jim. So if you want to beat him in a game of Hearthstone, you mm-hmm. need to recruit a lot of players from the zone. Mm-hmm. to go challenge him all at once. Unlike WoW, though, there is uh, not an automated feature that you can just click a button and it will automatically search for a party for you to take down Jambray. You <laughs> actually have to um, like play on the Europe ladder servers. Or just and... go on the forums and be like, yo, I want to make a party to take him down. Yeah, but yeah. then you, you can't actually party. You, you have to go at him one by one, mm. and you actually, actually have to be high enough rated to queue into him. Hmm. Okay. So a little bit different than with her gym, but almost the same. I mean, you you wanted me to smile and nod at this analogy, so I'm gonna. That was a great analogy, TJ. No, I'm not giving you that. No. no. It, give just give me a nice, powerful pal, paladin pat on the pancreas. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where the pancreas is, somewhere in there. All right. Well, we had a chance to talk to Amnesiac a little bit about this week. Let's hear what he had to say about this port in the Hearthstone Global Games. My name is Amnijak, and I can give you a young savage guarantee that the USA will win the Hearthstone Global Games. I think the Team USA does a really good job of kind of understanding what each person brings to the table. We kind of understand who's best at what and where we can get certain input from some people versus certain input from others. So I think that helps us gel as a team really well. When it comes to team prep, we sort of have two camps. I'd say that Dog and Firebat are sort of our idea people. You see Dog when he's streaming and Firebat when they're streaming. They like to play kind of off the wall. So that brings something interesting to the table when it comes to prep, and they'll notice things that I wouldn't even think of. So that's really valuable. Whereas I'd say that Hot Meowth and I, when it comes to prep, we're like the textbook people. We're looking at data. We're building decks. We've tested things. We're like we're much more by the book. Whereas Dog and Fire Rat sort of bring that that wild flair that really makes you like a good team. I think it's really exciting that Blizzard is pushing more than one format, irrespective of if this format is good or bad. I think it's just good that we have more of them. It makes people think and it gives people more room to innovate. The biggest stereotype I've noticed with America is everyone thinks we just like cheeseburgers, but we are diverse in what we like in fast food. We like cheeseburgers, a quick pizza is nice, we're pretty big into burritos over here. It kind of it kind of bothers me. We like our fast food, but we're not uncultured savages, guys. Come on. Welcome back to Talkstone. I'm Robert. This is TJ. Once again, we are currently waiting on the players to restart their computers. Uh, if you've never used a computer, they can be <laughs> finicky. A little difficult to trust. Amen to that, brother. <laughs> Yeah, so once that is settled, we will hop into the next match. Obviously, we are just as eager to get into that and stop uh, talking about TJ's pancreas. But yeah, in the meantime, we're... Oh, we won't talk about that. That's a sore subject for me. All the padding. <laughs> All the padding? <laughs> Made it sore. <laughs> oh, see what it did there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, United States started off with a great victory yep. in Gamer 1, Priest versus Priest, which is, you know, in tournaments... Not a matchup we get to see often, especially not Silence Priest versus Control Priest. So uh, I'm excited to see what, what we're going to have in store. It's it's not a, a creative week per se uh, compared to some of the other weeks of Global right. Weeks because it's single elimination. We're in the knockout stage. But you mentioned earlier, uh, the quest, because of the imminent changes, uh, the players were not allowed to play with uh, Caverns Below for Rogue. So uh, they had to innovate not only on the Rogue front, but also you know adjust their some of their decks and some of their strategy based on there being no Quest Rogue available. So yeah, maybe a little bit of creativity. I was going to say, some of, the, some of the winners of the Quest Rogue change are obviously just control decks in general feel a lot safer. So if you're thinking, okay, I need to bring nine decks, what do I feel safe bringing? You, you don't have to worry about the Quest Rogue this week at all. You don't even have to think, okay, well, is a five-bounce Quest Rogue still enough to fear? You just don't mm. have to worry about that this week. Mm-hmm. So Quest Rogues, but then J-Druid, right? J-Druid, we're, I was actually watching a fair bit of DreamHack Valencia. Yeah. Right? J-Druid... The, the premium on that deck is just at an all-time high because the, the deck that traditionally punishes it is largely phased out of the meta for 
other tournaments as well as obviously just, as we said, being barred from this portion of the Hearthstone Global game. So uh, I'm curious to see how that affected the way teams prepared if they just yeah. said, okay, no, we don't need Aggro Druid, just bring Jade Druid. Yeah, the one thing about DreamHack meta, though, is it's last year standing. Yeah. And you sort of have to go back to the drawing board, and players didn't really have much time. Uh, they had, a, I think, an extra 24-hour extension to submit decks. And I don't know if people really pinned Jade Druid as being the deck that was going to be dominant uh, with that amount of time. Right. So they had to think, well, I need a deck in my lineup that counters Jade Druid, but what deck counters Jade Druid consistently enough? Do I have time to build one, or should I build my lineup to do something else not expecting it? So that was a little bit weird. In Conquest, like we have here at the Global Games, Jade Druid can only take a maximum of one win. So you know you can sort of ignore it if you so choose. Uh, but not going to see any of that. Looks like a... Actually, it's impossible to tell right now what Shaman that is, because pretty much all Shamans nowadays run those three cards, but it definitely is Control Paladin. Yeah, it remains to be seen whether or not the Nazoth package is being run, but the Forbidden Healing, the Doomsayer, Telltale Signs, the Wild Pyromancer as well, that uh, this is going to go a little bit slower. Now, depending on what type of Shaman this is, uh, there, there are certainly odd wrinkles to the matchup, but in general, Paladin tends to have a bit of an uphill battle against the Shaman because the Shaman's just constant ability generally, regardless of archetype, to just crowd the board and kind of force the Paladin to play from the perspective of Brinksmanship. Mm -hmm. When do I actually commit that premium removal? Uh, I can only do it so many times. And then the Shaman can keep getting in chip damage, keep threatening the Bloodlust. So yeah. very interested to see how Firebat navigates this. Taiwan can, can afford to be really patient. Uh, you mentioned sort of the not expending your premium removal. So you can sort of get into a game of chicken a little bit where the Shaman refuses to commit a ton of minions into the board. They can develop some weak minions and just keep toteming up. Try and force the removal out, but make sure that they threaten lethal or close to lethal with Bloodlust. Whereas the Paladin from the other side has to think, well, does my opponent have reload? Can I afford to use while Paramount's Equality, Equality Consecration in this stage. Yeah, dude, or I was going to say the, the Primal Fin Totem is actually a great example of just a minion you put down. It's generating additional board presence. You don't want to commit anything involving a Pyromancer or an Equality, so uh, I would imagine for Firebat, the Doomsayer has to look pretty good here. The Flame Tongue Totem is not a punish. Uh, I, I just think this is right here, just a super clean Doomsayer, uh, if you can actually just get it to stick. Yeah. Devolve can punish Doomsayers. Sure. But is it worth using a Devolve to protect your Primal Fin Totem? I mean, there there are situations in this matchup where the Devolve is just purely used to get through taunts. You just need taunts to not be taunts anymore to pair with the Bloodlust, pair with the Flame Tongue Totem. So uh, the Devolve, yes, can deal with the Doomsayer at this point, and I, I don't hate it being used, but it is something that uh, you realize as a tool mm -hmm. could perhaps see more use later on. Spike Ridge Steed. Uh, yeah. Even Sunkeeper Terran boards, uh, Tyrion. If you get to the later stage of the game, since you've seen the Doomsayer, you can pin it on being control. You also may need it for uh, Primordial Drake to get through a taunt, or Ragnaros Light Lord to deny the healing. Even though you're giving them seven drops, sometimes you need that. So it is an absolutely premium card. The other thing about using the Devolve here is it's not like you're using the Devolve and then also developing something else, right? You're just protecting the Primal Fin uh, and then the, the additional Murloc that's being generated. Looks like Roger's going to go ahead and kind of take the option where he's like, okay, I can go ahead and just get the Jade Claws online. Mm -hmm. That's something I can do that turn that is productive and I don't have to use the Devolve. So uh, it does something, but the, the board ultimately goes the way of the dinosaurs. Gone. <laughs> get it? Yeah, because you love dinosaurs. I do have dinosaurs. I actually have a dinosaur magnet on my fridge. <laughs> Can you guess which dinosaur it is? Nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing nerdy about liking dinosaurs, DJ. I can't guess what dinosaur it is. Yeah, I lied. I don't have one. I was just hoping. I was trying to debate okay. you. Okay. I was going to say, which dinosaurs are bald? I think a lot of them. Most of them just don't have hair. That's kind of like a big thing about being a dinosaur. I'm basically a dinosaur. Except you have hair on your chin. And probably you're back. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Well, <laughs> in game, we did see the stampeding Kodo come down. Going to go ahead and clear the board. I shaved my back, man. <laughs> Not gross. Yeah, glad to hear it, Rob. Glad to hear it. Was that literally just a build up to you like wanting to ask that question? Yes, it was. All right. 
I, I do often see you staring at my back, and I, I wonder if that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. But now I know. You got me. You caught me, Detective Rob. All right, well, Doppelgangster looks like it's just going to be used. They have a second Doppelgangster, and they need to threaten something. But, man, this seems like a really weak play, because even on board, one of these Doppelgangsters is challenged, and they don't have an Evolve to sort of follow it up. They're basically saying, well, I hope you don't have anything, and we hope we can try and protect these Doppelgangsters uh, going into the next turn, but Firebat and the United States have a ton of ways uh, to deal with multiple boards as this game goes on. They can definitely afford to use a Consecration, considering they have two of their equality activators in hand already with uh, Wild Pyromancer and for late game, Primordial Drake. Yeah, I was going to ask, do you feel that Doppelgangster was warranted? There was the option to just put down a Firefly, make a Totem, just keep taking it slowly. Yeah. Do you, do you think you have to put that down there? I, I think so. It's a weak play, but the one thing about Shaman is that as soon as you lose control of the board, it is very hard to get it back, especially with a control uh, reactive deck, at least in the beginning stages of the game, uh, like Control Paladin. Because they have a bunch of big boys. If you lose the board, they're just going to keep dropping big threat after big threat, and you'll never get the board back. So I feel like the, with the way their hand was going, they couldn't afford to totem up Firefly because it just was too weak of a play. Now they draw Bloodlust, which is a terrible draw because it's rare that you need two, and they already have one in their hand. And they still don't have board. So we may see a situation again where they have to make a weak play or doppelgangster, which is also a weak play. They have to make a weak play or a weaker play. Yeah, I mean, they have the doppelgangster, but the one of the issues that Shaman runs into is the card draw is extremely poor. It's essentially just mana tied totem at this point. Yeah. And they're not, so they're going basically on one card per turn, mm -hmm. and they're not drawing really much closer to evolve. So. That said, I still think you have to protect the Doppelganger because I think that is going to be your biggest potential threat. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they've pretty much gone with what you suggested there, which is kind of this weak line where you go wide with small minions, having just seen one Consecration. And yeah, the most common forms of card draw found in this Evolve Shaman deck are Manti Totem and Wind Up Burglebot from the Doppelganger Evolve. Those are the most common. What's Wind Up Burglebot? It's a, uh, it is a six mana five five that mm. whenever it attacks a minion and survives, it draws a card. Sounds crazy. Why wouldn't people just run that? Mm, I, I don't know. Mm. I tried it out in a, uh, a form of Miracle Paladin. Uh, it didn't work out too well. I was mm. like, well, if I pop a Blessing of Wisdom on this bad boy, it kills a minion and survives, it draws two cards. But then I realized I can just put Blessing of Wisdom on a better card, <laughs> and uh, it serves as sort of a similar purpose. But Sure. Ooh. Curator is probably the only good option here, but they already have a curator, and their hand's going to be really clunky. I was going to say, what else, what else are they going to be drawing? Maybe second Drake? Probably just inside a track, or second Primordial Drake off of it. Probably a second Kodo yeah. uh, as well. Uh, hydrologist, if they have a, they're going to have a second Hydrologist as well. So they actually go ahead and take the Twilight Geomancer just because they realize that their hand would be too clunky with two curators. You really only need one. And that's just going to be a way to, I guess, in the later stages of the game, maybe buy them another turn, because it, it will, it will at least absorb in a minion attack if Bloodless comes out, and they want to sort of save some of this removal. And right now they're just going to plop a Doomsayer behind this wall, and they can get through it, but they'd have to use the Bloodless to do so. I don't think. Ah, uh, no, they can get through it with. Uh, no, they can't. Yeah, they'd have to. Or devolve. They have been sitting or on that devolve. for a while. I mean, that's that's another thing too. Is the Taiwan let the first one resolve way back in the day, and devolve has been sitting there since the the opening hand. Mm -hmm. So at this point, yeah, I mean, I cards have been drawn since then. Not that many. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they choose to to handle this because they've already pretty much said we want to save that devolve for something else. This might be that something else. I was going to say, a lot, of, a lot of time has passed, and they, they do need to start sticking this board. So, yeah, they're going to go ahead and just go with the Devolve here, see what they get after getting rid of the Stonehill Defender. All right, so they're actually going to get rid of it. They're just going to use the Devolve on the Doomsayer. I think this is pretty smart because two drops they can pretty much control, but Stonehill Defender gives them a two, and Stampeding Coda would give them a four. And if they can trade off into yeah. it easily, I think it's better to not take the risk of getting a minion that you can't really get through. Like, say from the uh, Stampeding Kodo, a Mogushan Warden comes out, and all of a sudden, yeah. they can't even get through the first one without uh, a lot of attacks, and they're left with a weaker board because of it. So Stonehill Defender could have just become another Doomsayer. It could have become another... That's 
true. I mean, what happens when that one Doomsayer turns into not a Doomsayer, but the Stonehill Defender turns into a Doomsayer? And then you just wasted your Devolve. So I yeah. definitely think this was correct sequencing from Taiwan. They're just going to hope now with how poor their hand is oh. that another minion that they'd want to Devolve doesn't come out. With double Bloodlust, all they need is one opening, one weak turn from the United States in order to finish the game. But that could be difficult for them. And Firebat and US need to think here, well, what's the best way? If I'm going into um, Primordial Drake next turn, almost regardless, I'm going to use my removal here and force them to have reload after we've already seen a Doppelgangster in order to get through. So I like this. I like it too because United States can make the read that the card on the far left has been there since turn one. Yes. Card in the middle has been there since turn two. So it's clear that they are saving these resources. And when you think to yourself, okay, what's the Bloodlust Shaman really sitting on? Mm -hmm. It's probably Bloodlust. It's probably Doppel or second copy of Doppelganger. Yeah. So they make the read that it's okay to just go ahead and commit the premium removal and just basically say, okay, as you said, you have to rebuild a board or else we just win over time. Yeah. Uh, draw a Jade Lightning there. The Jade Lightning does clear the Stonehill Defender. It just feels really bad to use there. You're generating, what, a 3-3. Three, three. You're getting rid of the front half a of a card, and then you Hero Power. Are you at the point where you just have to commit the Doppelgangster now? You've seen a Consecration. You've seen a Pyromancer Equality. Going you are into going into the though. Drake turn. Yeah. Did you forget about Drake? You can't forget about Drake. I, I think there's a. it's a different rapper. Did you forget about Eminem? Maybe that's what it was. I think so. Okay. Yeah, that is a pretty weak play. I think at this point they're like, well, we're going to need that uh, that that evolve ASAP. <laughs> Two and 18. One and nine. Math. 0.5 and 4.5. It's, it's roughly 60%. Um, I think, to draw it next turn. Well, that's pretty good then. I mean, you take that. I take that. Well, Primordial Drake doesn't completely clear the board, but this is a, a fairly uh, puny board, all things considered. And yeah, it's not one that you necessarily have to be afraid of. Again, you were, you were putting Taiwan on the onus of you have to reload the board. Yeah. Uh, and what they did there, if you're willing to commit a Jade Lightning into a Stonehill Defender, it's probably just because you don't have better options and you're really just looking for the 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, and the, the longer this game goes on without Taiwan committing more, the better of a read that the U.S. is going to be able to get on, on how their hand looks. If they make another weak play this turn, they can pinpoint two of those guards in hand as Bloodlust, almost certainly. If Doppelgangster isn't played, they can almost pinpoint at least one of the cards on the right side as being an Evolve because they haven't really had a board besides the Doppelgangsters on five that they would have wanted to Evolve. Maybe the turn where they use a Devolve to clear up the Doomsayer, but they didn't float a mana that turn, so uh, even then. So we'll have to see how United States is going to play this one out. The second Primordial Drake draw also actually ends up being a big deal because what that might do with a Consecration and a Primordial Drake gone is make Taiwan feel more comfortable about playing that second doppelgangster because two sweep effects are gone and US hasn't really drawn much. And it looks like they are gonna go for it. Well, they have the double bloodlust on turn 10 and they basically say, okay, this is gonna be our window to get something yeah. done. If you don't have it. Which they do. They do. We know they do. We know. Chat knows. Taiwan, however, does not know. And this will almost certainly be the nail in the coffin for the U.S. once the second Primordial Drake comes down. A full board wipe and AHQ Roger and the whole HGG team of Taiwan is incredibly sad. Yeah, they're about to go down 0-2 here in this series where, again, if they lose this, they're just out. And I mean, I know, I know USA probably feels pretty confident about winning, yeah. uh, but I have to imagine Taiwan is also feeling pretty good given their competitive pedigree. But yeah, we're just going to see the, this is what I had, you know, just lay out your cards mm. and then Taiwan's going to concede. United States off to a pretty quick 2-0 to zero lead and a great position for them. We've seen them have some sweeps throughout global games, most notably in their final match of phase two against Israel, where it was sort of a do or die situation. The, both teams were one and one. Right. And the team that was in uh, third in that group, which was uh, Belgium, I believe, at one and two, had a pretty good record for a one and two team. 
So if they had lost, then they would have been put themselves in a rough situation. That's what happened to Israel. They didn't make it to the next phase because they lost that match. Uh, All right, so let's go ahead and take a look, though, at the score for this series. As we see, 2-0 in favor of the United States. Up next is going to be Malagos, Taiwan, won the Warrior, taking on Hot Meowth on the Shaman. Yeah, and another Shaman deck. Well, it would be interesting to see if this is the same type of Shaman that Taiwan brought or if we are going to see some a little bit of experimentation <laughs> with a class that a lot of people were hyped for after seeing the Rogue changes but not after seeing the rogue changes, after seeing the elemental changes. I would be kind of surprised by this. The The USA team in general has, for the most part, beyond like week one or week two with a kind of a, a weird pre-stack they brought, mm. they've been pretty much all business. And Hot Meowth in general is someone who is more of a, a play by the lines kind of guy. You know, obviously most of us know from the world championship and you're thinking, you know, blood giants warrior with something we saw but since then he's he's really changed his ways and kind of come home I, I don't think that changed his ways i think it just convinced him that he shouldn't change his ways no. and uh he got that deck from rage who you know met, met on several occasions and both hot meowth and rage have said it wasn't the deck <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Sure. It wasn't the deck. Uh, Hot Meowth uh, knows after looking back that he said he felt like he was practiced enough coming in, but as soon as he got on that big stage, you know, it, it got him a little bit, and he wasn't able to perform the way he was in practice with the deck. But again, since then and before then, he's definitely a guy that, like you mentioned, plays by the book. And we saw Hot Meowth rocking the Summer Championship trophy from last year in the background on his dresser and also rocking that Panda Global jersey, repping Panda Global, I believe, with Ray C., Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. yeah, he is uh, on one of those teams that's really trying to prove themselves in the North American scene. And, uh, you know, Hot Meowth is part of a group of, I would say, nine or ten players who, when you, you ask average competitive Hearthstone fan, who really represents a competitive North American Hearthstone, his name is on that short list. Yeah, there's a lot of players that, you know, sort of barely miss out on those huge opportunities. Hot Meowth had his huge opportunity, yep. but there's a lot of players exactly like him who haven't gotten to that point yet. I think Racy was one of them, his teammate. Yeah. Uh, he's recently had some success. You know, he won a tournament earlier in the year. Uh, I believe it was early, earlier this year, yeah, and he's had a, a bunch of top finishes since then. So uh, definitely a player to look out for. And, uh, you know, we'll see if he can do big things like Hot Meowth did in, in last year's uh, championship tour. Yeah, a lot of the North American guys are, are just kind of starting to get really their big shot. Ant obviously comes to mind. Astrogation is another player who's always just flirting with those top eight finishes at mm -hmm. big events. So uh, North America starting to, you know, follow in the footsteps of some of the early pedigree set by, say, Firebat. But, uh, yeah, going into this one, Shaman versus Warrior. You know, Warrior has, unlike the other decks, really just kind of hit their two archetypes very early and just kind of stood pat. You know, we saw a lot of the Taunt Warrior at the Spring Championship uh, Nyria, Kalento, both bringing that deck. Yep. Uh, otherwise, it, it's just recently been a lot of Pirate Warrior for both uh, how quickly the deck does what it's supposed to do, the the sheer power behind it, and uh, the major thing that's kind of shifted in the last month of Journey to Angoro is just kind of some of the tech choices. Sure, yeah. And, you know, we, we're seeing in Pirate Warrior, cards like Moral Strike uh, rotate out a little bit, and Grimy Gadgeteer and Spellbreaker, sort of that card, the four slot that players have been going more towards. Uh, grabbing edge of tier really lets you sort of solidify a lead whereas mortal strike is and, and in a deck that's trying to be proactive sometimes mortal strike doesn't fit that bell um whereas grabbing edge tier does it allows you to be proactive and to present threats instead of having a card that for most part of the game just deals four damage for four right. mana ends up being pretty good so i can see why but this is one of those uh class matchups that really heavily depends on the archetypes before we can you know say who's favored but it looks like it is going to be Evolve Shaman versus Taunt Warrior. And Taiwan should have a pretty big edge in this matchup. Yeah, there's just so many board sweeps in this style of Warrior. Just so many ways to uh, just deal damage to the entirety of the board. You know, add in Sleep with the Fishes, add in a Primordial Drake. You know, obviously the Brawls are always lurking. So it's difficult for the Shaman to get a foothold. Uh, that said, I have certainly seen this matchup won by the Shaman because the Warrior tends to suffer from very poor card draw. So if the resources aren't there to contest early on a wide board, that Bloodlust just comes out on five, comes out on six, a big Evolve land, something happens, then early on, uh, the Shaman can absolutely take that match. Yeah, and I believe this is one of the matchups where if you know you're playing against Evolve Shaman, the win rate does increase slightly if you throw the quest away. Yep. Yeah, that's not but, really what you're going to be needing to beat them. It's, it's basically yeah. just starving them of resources. But this is Global Games, and they don't know what kind of Shaman it is. And if it's a Jade Shaman, you definitely want Quest. Yeah, they've gone ahead, though, and pitched it. 
I think just, that's a good call. Based yeah. on United States' typical play style, I think this is... Well, and in the Hearthstone Global Games in general, when people have brought not Evolved Shaman, it usually goes very poorly, right? And, it, and we tend to see it more from Southeast Asia. They're like, all right, I'm going to play an Elemental Shaman this week and see how it goes, and it yeah. just gets beaten. The only deck, or the only country that had a ton of success with pure Jade Shaman, like the Control Jade Shaman, was Mexico. Yep. They won with it in so many weeks in a row. And I remember specifically when I came to cast one of the weeks with Korra early on, Mexico, I believe, was facing Taiwan in the most intense... Actually, I wouldn't call it intense. We'll just say long. <laughs> long Jade Shaman versus Jade oh, Shaman yeah, 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 yeah. mirror. And the, the game, that specific game, lasted an hour. I remember I, I got back from Iceland and I, I hadn't seen the cast and I was just like, hey, how was it? And you just kind of looked at me with dead eyes and you were like, Shaman ma Mirror, yeah, long. That, that's all I said. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> it was it was, it was, was tough to cast, to be honest, because it was hard to see the panouts of the game and what teams were going for. It was hard to get into the minds of the players. That just goes to show when, you know, the way you, you look at Hearthstone and evaluate matchups, a lot of it is just predicated on results you've seen in the past. So when mm -hmm. you're put in that situation where you have to evaluate these things in real time, it, especially for a long, grindy game where there's so little actual pressure being generated, it certainly becomes confusing. And for me, I had only seen up to that point probably three total games of uh, competitive games of Jade Shaman versus Jade Shaman. And I can imagine the players that were playing were in a similar boat because it's not a deck you play on ladder very much. And a lot of the players, especially on Mexico, don't have a ton of tournament experience. Yeah. They were probably seeing that matchup, you know, in a pretty tough light as well. But uh, we'll see. Uh, it, it should be pretty smooth sailing for Taiwan, especially considering the amount of early removal that they have. Yeah, Ravage the, Gold plus Sleep with yep. the Fishes is even better than a Brawl in a lot of cases against this deck. So I'm really curious when, uh, if anytime soon, Hot Meowth is going to look to pull the trigger on the Evolve. A lot of times you you obviously just want to link up that Evolve to Doppelganger. That's where you get a lot of your, your just straight power. But if you're saying to yourself, okay, the more cards that are drawn by the Warrior, just strictly speaking, the worse my odds get to win the game. Do I want to just try to make a powerful board early and just start pushing pressure? They don't have a Bloodlust just yet, but they do have a Flame Tongue Totem. So certainly pressure to be pushed if they want to invest. I just want to point out that I, I like Doppelgangster. Like, like, like? Would you, would you, because keep in mind, that's three dudes. No, like as a friend. Okay, okay, I was going to say, that's, who do you give the note to in the hallway? Which Doppelgangster? Well, that's, it's one of the reasons why I like it, because, Rob, uh -huh. uh, story time. Okay. A doppelganger is a being that is very similar to another being. So if you were to say, wow, that guy's my doppelganger. He would look very much like you. So in this Doesn't context, nec wouldn't necessarily yeah. act like you, but mm -hmm. look very much like you. And the funny part about doppelgangers is they're all gangsters. So they're doppelganger, but they're also gangsters. So they're doppelgangers. Just genius. Yeah, the the people who make cards, man, they knock it out of the park. They really do. Just they, to, they are gangsters themselves. Just to put a, a ribbon on this conversation, so. Uh, your doppelganger, for example, is Frodan, because you two are so similar. Mm. I think we'll need to have another <laughs> lesson later, Rob, but great try. Well, you did dye your hair at one point. I did. And I assumed it was to look more like Frodan. Mm -hmm. It was not. Okay. Well, yeah. you know what? I tried, TJ. Your lessons are just not crystal clear to me. I'm not a good teacher. What can I say? All right. Well, Hobby Ooh. had the option here to just Jade Lightning this Acolyte of Pain. Uh, and keep the minions on board, or could have gone for the Flame Tongue Totem. That's interesting. Flame Tongue Totem creates more pressure on board. You also give one, over one of her, one other card over. You can totem up as well to make your thing from below cheaper. And also, Flame Tongue Totem, it, it doesn't necessarily give you immediate reach. Are those Murlocs doppelgangsters? Yes. Great Rob job, Rob. gets it. <laughs> Those okay. Murlocs, while they are doppelgangers of each other... They have clubs. <laughs> okay, fair enough. They are gangsters as well. They're the gangsters of the Murloc world. I did get it. All right, production, here's a test for you. Bring up the card that is summoned from Primal Fin Totem. <laughs> I think I stumped him. I don't think they can do it. They can't. No. Well, in the meantime, while we wait for production to uh, level up their game... <laughs> Taiwan has some very easy ways. Nope. <laughs> Close. Close production. Try, Try again. again. That is a Murloc with a sword. That is a... Nope. <laughs> that is a spear. That is old Murkai. 
does not come from Pile for Totem Close. Oh, he's riding a frog. Murloc Knight. Ah, again, uh, you're getting closer. <laughs> I honestly, I, I think that's from calling the finishers, but I honestly don't know. Okay, that guy has swords. Now, I, you know, production, it's you're just embarrassing yourself at this point. Just <laughs> calm down. Thank you. Uh, in the meantime, while we were learning about production's inadequacies, uh, we, we did see a pretty sufficient board clear come out, and this is exactly what Taiwan wants. They have mm. the board now. They're basically putting the onus back on the Shaman to to do something, and then they feel confident that between their second copy of Ravaging Ghoul and Super the Fishes, they have answers. Yeah. And, I mean, the deck has plenty of answers. It's going to be hard for the United States to find a point where they can reload enough on the board to feel comfortable about winning with a, with Bloodlust, but not investing so much on the board to where they play too heavily into the ton of removal that Taiwan has. And that's where, in this deck, a lot of times, you have to sort of just act like they don't have it. At a certain point, you just have to go all in on the board and hope... <laughs> yes! <laughs> They've right. done it. It they only took it. them five minutes, but they got there. Good job, production. Give yourself a, a warm pat on the back. A pat on the pancreas. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, to your point, they, they really do just kind of have to dance like nobody's watching mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, that, that board clear, if it's there, it, it just it torpedoes them. I but if it's not there, that's how they're going to win the game. Mm -hmm. It might just be they have, you know, uh, poorly statted taunts. Yeah, Shaman in this match is very much like Rob in real life. In what way? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't question it. You just accept the fact. No, I, I want answers. Well, Evolve Shaman against Taunt Warrior is like Rob in real life because a lot of times <laughs> you know you're going to lose, uh -huh. <laughs> but sometimes you just have to hope they don't have it. All right. Yeah, that does sound like a, that does sound like a situation I'm familiar with. <laughs> Thanks, Deej. <laughs> All right. Well, big board for Hot <laughs> in USA. Uh, could have chosen to go ahead and with the and, and drop that evolve. They had a big enough board. The thing from below certainly uh, would be uh, synergistic with evolve. It's one of the cool things about the card is oftentimes you pay very little to nothing for it, and then mm -hmm. evolve makes it a seven drop. Yeah. But no, Taiwan's like nope. Would you play evolve in real life? Well, it depends. Uh, I'm a one drop, so there's a chance I just become a doomsayer. So maybe I wouldn't do it. I'd evolve you, Teej, but there's there's no higher mana cost card. I would just turn right back into a mountain giant. Yep. <laughs> there's the evolve. I'm just waiting for production to just put a picture of like you up there with like the mountain giant. That'd be good. Would like be. that mashup. All right. Well, United States can just <laughs> United States can just drop the individually powerful Eye of Black Paw, and could even choose to go for evolve if they want to there. Obviously, you're losing out on some of the the cool downside or cool upsides rather of I Black Paw, but you don't have the doppelganger in hand. And when are you actually going to start looking to get value from the I Black Paw? I have Black Paw. A lot of the times, because of its six drop, reminds me of Hogger. All right, I guess it just now we <laughs> they left me hanging. That was a real bummer. Just when you think you can trust him. Just when you think you can trust him. All right, so goes ahead and chooses to forego the evolve there. I uh, just puts enough power on the board and basically says, have another answer. Just just have one more, I dare you. They do. They have plenty. One more board clear and I'm out. And then they tr <laughs> then they draw a double Parmodial Drake. So they have Brawl, double Parmodial Drake. They have another Brawl in the deck. They're honestly put the fishes, but at a certain point, they're going to get to the to a stage where they can just keep playing top minions and yep. just utilizing their their soul for us as removal when they finally draw the quest <laughs> and complete if it. If they have enough taunts to do it by if then. If they have enough taunts to do it by then, which they may not. But at, at a certain point, because of the lack of card draw from Shaman, uh, they know that they're going to eventually run them out of resources. So, yeah, we'll see. I, I think that the U.S. has had a pretty good hand for this matchup. They haven't had very many dead cards. They have been able to reload beyond the two board clears. And they're drawing cards that generate additional value beyond their initial effect. Jade Lining, Jade Claws, uh, Stonehill Defender generates that taunt. And they haven't drawn like the Bloodlust 
yet, which means that they're probably going to draw it later on in the game when it's going to be the most impactful, unless they've lost it by that point where when it wouldn't even matter. So, what is Ding from below at right now? I think it's at zero. Uh, it's at zero or one. Uh, I guess we'll not see because so got the slither is the pickup, and so got the slither actually ends up being pretty good. They wouldn't show Hogger, but they show Saga. Oh my gosh! So you evolve here, right? Because next turn, yeah, next turn you're gonna play Saga off. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. There's Hogger. I mean, it's late. Oh, did I say Hogger? I meant Cairn. TJ, there you are. It evolved into you. Oh, the Rabbitsaur run. Yeah. Oh, did did I say Cairn? I meant Wind Up Burglebot. <laughs> He said, wind up Burglebot. <laughs> Did I say wind up Burglebot? <laughs> I meant Ancient of Blossoms. Did I say Ancient of Blossoms? <laughs> I meant the six drop dire horn thing. <laughs> I can't remember the name of. That's Not five. <laughs> <laughs> Come Close. on, production. You know, I would, I mean, that's right, I told you, before we, we did this cast, I opened up a single pack, and I got a golden Ravisaur Runt, which was a good omen for the broadcast. Ah, yes. My brethren. <laughs> My brethren in arms. Well, funny interaction here, the South Sea Squid Face can uh, make the Jade Claws be a higher attack. They can Jade Claws trade in the South Sea Squid Face, and then their Jade Claws is four attacks, and they can trade into the Primordial Drake that way. And they're also going to get, wait for it, There's going to be a minion. Let's see how quick they are. Come on, Crystal Runner. TJ had his hand on my shoulder for the record there as he was saying, hey, wait, for about 15 seconds. It was just mm. extremely uncomfortable. There it is. A little bit slow on the draw, but uh, that's, a, that's actually a pretty good uh, outcome for... Uh, the United States because they basically got to evolve twice on a single minion. They got a really good outcome from that evolve because it allowed them to basically generate a ton of additional power on the board because of the interaction between South Sea Squid Face, the Jade Claws, and the, uh, was it a Lotus Illusionist? Yeah. Uh, at that four mana slot, which turns into a six mana minion when it hits face. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, we actually saw the United States forego the hero power there just to make their board less vulnerable to Brawl. They, yeah. The Rose have a, a relatively slim board by Shaman standards. It's just three minions. Two of them are actually repping a fair bit of power. So the totem would have been strictly worse, although maybe that does tell Taiwan that the two cards left, n neither one is Bloodlust. It, it may... Maybe not, though. Oh, I was going to say, maybe that's just actually enough damage to where they feel like they... It is enough yeah, damage yeah. on board yep. to where Bloodlust would win. But a lot of times, because of you know the amount of spot removal that they also have with Execute, you'd want to, if you had Bloodlust in your hand, have a little bit of insurance in that case. Sure. But it's going to pay off for the U.S. here because Taiwan's going to have to be forced to use the Brawl. And it's one of the poorer outcomes, the Jade. Really doesn't matter between that and the Crystal Runner. But still, I mean, this is that attrition style that we talked about where it's going to be hmm. super... Ooh, that's actually... That's interesting. So we saw, hmm. I want to say, Muzzy was running at the Spring Championship. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it obviously, the Sea Giant is very powerful in the mirror and very powerful against decks that are more board-centric. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is not what they're looking for. But the Sea Giant in this deck, in this situation, does just give them another big drop, which is actually really good for them. Yeah, we saw a couple of... We've seen a couple of evolutions of the Evolved Shaman uh, recently, one being the Sea Giant. It's better in tournament lineups because you're most likely going to be facing mirror matchups if your strategy is to not ban Shaman. And Sea Giant's just incredibly good in the mirror. Two, the second uh, evolution that we've saw, we saw from uh, Spring Championships was RDU, who put a Barnes in the deck in place of a Stonehill Defender. Stonehill Defender, it's actually boasts a pretty low win rate when played early on in the game. Uh, from the uh, Shaman deck. It doesn't, it's not as impactful as say it would be in Taunt Warrior or Paladin because it doesn't have super strong class taunts besides the thing from below to discover. And it, it does give you additional evolve fodder because if you take out a high cost minion from your deck, you're getting a five drop from Barnes and you're also getting whatever came out of your deck. If you get thing from below, you get a seven drop. So right. 
Uh, he he felt the deck needed additional evolve fodder. A little bit of oomph. A little yeah. bit of oomph because a lot of times you have evolve dead in your hand without doppelganger, and you doppelganger is okay by itself, but evolve is usually pretty bad by itself. So he felt like he wanted another sort of you know really strong potential with evolve for the deck, and I really like that choice as yeah. well. So one thing there that I, I do think is interesting, maybe it, it's not. I'm willing to believe that what they did was correct, but uh, there was a world where Hot Meowth could have used the claws and then traded in. Oh, no, no, never mind. I was going to say they could have also gotten rid of the Jade Golem, but they couldn't have to make it just a little bit better against Brawl. And Sawgoth could just be what you're looking to have as your, your individual win condition at this point, because it is actually just so difficult for the warrior to, to remove. But yeah, they couldn't have actually gotten rid of the Jade Golem, so it wouldn't have mattered. This is true. I mean, this is actually a pretty intimidating board from the US. One Brawl is gone. It's likely that there's two, but there's a possibility for one, as we've seen uh, quite a few times in Warrior decks. And they're starting to run out of resources, and because they pitched away the quest and have not drawn it, one, they don't have that sort of inevitability engine, and two, they have a dead draw of the quest in their deck still. So any one of these draws could be the quest, which is going to end up being pretty dead. Well, it's pretty much on Sawgoth now. He's going to have to do the heavy lifting. The Sea Giant is down there, but the Sea Giant is much more susceptible to the traditional methods of removal from the Warrior. Although, that said, you, you have seen an execute now. So, unless you run into that second one, maybe the Sea Giant is good just for pushing pressure and doing battle on the board. Seen execute, seen both Ravaging Ghouls, yeah. both Sleep with the Fishes, a Whirlwind, one Primordial Drake, I believe, one Brawl. So, there's an execute left in the deck, but aside from that, there's pretty little amounts of removal. This could, there could be a possibility for the United States to pull out a win. It's still going to be tough because Primordial Drake's going to be tough for them to get through, but it's not impossible. Did uh, Bloodsail Court, did we already see patches for the United States? I don't think we did. We, uh, we no did. They played, a, I okay. believe they played a Bloodsail Corsair earlier when they combined it with the Flamethrow Totem. Yeah, that's what it was. That's what it was. We, but, were, we were obviously having a sillier moment, but. I think that's when we were talking about uh, Doppelgangster. Yeah. And your life choices. <laughs> Thankfully, they do not have a drawer with a card to pop out to show my life choices. Or so you think. My God. <laughs> Firefly. I mean, at this point, I was going to say that's a pretty poor draw, but there's a lot of cards in their deck that'd be even worse draws than Firefly. Yeah, I mean, at least there you're putting two bodies on the board. Yeah. yeah. It, it'd be better to draw Firefly than Bloodlust as opposed to Bloodlust than Firefly. I think now, at this point, Doppelgangster would be a great draw for them. Yeah, just to go wide on the board and just start prepping for, mm -hmm. for basically drawing that Bloodlust. Do you also go ahead and put down the Blood, blood Cell Corsair there? I, I think he, at this point, because you sort of need to protect the minions that you have on your board, you want to wait for a weapon. Right, destroy a second charge of a Fiery War Axe. Yeah, at, yeah. at that point, you know, what is another 1-2 on the board going to do if you don't even have Bloodlust in your hand? You'd well, rather I mean, try and you... protect your minions. Yeah, but if you draw it off the top, it is an extra four damage. I mean, that's at this point, it's, it's basically the argument of protecting the board versus do I want to be prepped for a top deck bloodlust? Sure. Yeah. I wonder. And this is where even though, you know, Taiwan isn't generating a lot of resources, the quality of their cards in terms of of what it does against the Shaman's win condition will ultimately edge out mm. unless something uh, massive happens for Hot Meowth in the next couple turns here. And I can't even think of much. Yeah, maybe. So second Sea Giant is obviously big. If they have one, which I don't know if that's likely considering the deck is pretty tight on, on what it can cut. Yeah. Um, or uh, like I said, Doppelgangster might be okay, but at this point there's already minions on the board that can work on contesting it. Uh, there it is. Maybe if they draw, maybe if they go doppelganger, and then their very next card is Bloodlust. But even then, they have, they'll have to spend so much of their their board getting through the taunts that they may not have enough board left or enough damage left to be able to get through fully. And I believe this is their se second doppelganger. Well, the taunt totem does protect the doppelgangers. Once they come down, you can go ahead and use the Jade Claws and the two baby elementals there to get through the Stonehill Defender. So, 
Taunt Totem is a good roll there. Mm -hmm. I see the giant Macedon taking off the Stonehill Defender, so uh, a lot of times you would want to avoid a 9-drop minion as a quest warrior because you, you are going to be wanting to use the Ragnar's Hero Power consistently, but as Malagos did pitch that at the beginning of the game, uh, nine man at this point, you know, what's what's another two armor? Realistically, that's not the issue. It's protecting the board and, and protecting yourself, it is. All right, just using to go ahead and just leave it up. Realizing it doesn't, on its own, do a good job interacting with the board. Yeah, it, it's not going to kill anything off by itself, and they'd rather have the flexibility of having two extra attack next turn should they draw Bloodlust. It might, you know, be the difference of them pushing five to face as opposed to two to face. So... Definitely like that, but Fire War Axe, this is what they were saving the Blood Cell Corsair for, but even the first charge is going to do work in sort of chipping down this board. They're down to a single draw per turn, unless they get Manatai Totem, and Manatai Totem at this point would be even too slow for them to be able to play. So you can see now just why pitching the quest in the Mulligans is usually correct against Evolve Shaman, if you know they're playing Evolve Shaman or have a good guess because... It allowed them to just keep tearing through the early board. And at no point in this game did Taiwan say, well, I wish they, you know, I wish we had the quest completed because they're just winning by a war of attrition. And Bloodlust is the best draw on the deck, but it still isn't enough. They have to trade in all of their minions in order to get through this board. I think all of their minions, maybe all but one, depending on I think it's on all but the healing totem, unless I'm wrong. It is all but the healing totem. Yeah. Oh, they can get in for three. Actually, it's all but the flame elemental, perhaps. Both doppelgangsters go into the five five or the five health tar creepers. The uh, claws goes into the stone hill defender. Oh yeah, yeah. So you can just leave one of the elementals up. Yeah, yeah. and push for four. Then you have a one two on board, a totem, and another one two on board, and your opponent is at thirty one. And you're just five to six meaningful cards away from a win. That a lot of which aren't in your deck. Five to six meaningful cards away from a win that would all have to come in the same turn. That might be the problem. I think that's the big issue there. Maybe and they can hope that, who knows, the Taiwan, their warrior deck, draws the quest next turn. Maybe draws an execute the turn after that. Just keeps drawing dead. That the taunt options that they were presented from Stonehill Defender. Actually, this is better. Uh, yeah, they leave the J-Calls up, so they leave the most power up, and it doesn't really matter, you know, what's there. But, I mean, here comes a giant Mastodon, and what are you going to do? Nah, it's pretty much the Ice Age for this game, unfortunately. Just go. Yeah, it's the Ice Age on the cake. <laughs> All right, well, there's the Manatai Totem, and it is in a position where it will be protected by that Stone Claw Totem. Uh, I got to say, hats off to the USA. They're... They're really trying to claw this one out. Yeah. They're they're not in a situation where they're going, okay, well, this is unfavored. Things look bad. We're just going to go ahead and just scoop it and go to the next one. They're absolutely trying to find an out in this game. A lot is on the line here. Even though they have a couple more opportunities to get that third win to move on to the round of eight. I have an axe to grow. You know, you, you best believe <laughs> that if I'm in the same position, I'm going to try my heart out to make it to, to make it through. Maelstrom portal, uh, not doing much at all. Oh, you're going to give them an eight drop. <laughs> okay, well, you know, it is a lower health taunt. Yeah. Look at the positives. Yeah, that's well power totem. At least it allows you to get through the adult grizzly. And more importantly, with the devolve, you're not giving them card draw. True. I mean, there, there are a lot of situations that are going... There are a lot of individual moving pieces that are going poorly for the U.S. in this match. Mm -hmm. But then you check out that one thing. We're like, well... We didn't let him draw cards on the Acolyte. Check. Got him. And there's going to be a point where they're going to just run out of cards. <laughs> Ali Armour said going to continue to gain armor. I mean, they can only take off two minions a turn, and ideally the United States would be able to develop three minions a turn to try and race against that, that clock. Interestingly enough, you can just put them on a two-turn lethal, potentially, with the Mana Geode and big tree hit and face you could you could just hit hit face with the big tree and then they have to get through all these minions you do have to do the bloodlust math so let's say they draw bloodlust exactly <laughs> next turn the bloodlust math is it's not enough 18 by a lot eight plus they actually have an if bloodlust is drawn they have enough damage to get through everything and leave two minions alive i believe i mean sure but that's it that's your second bloodlust like and then you hope that they draw the quest the following turn it's a uh -huh. dead draw and then you draw 
insert impactful minion here. Like we're talking like not not like even like a little <laughs> bit impactful. We're talking like real like it doesn't even exist. We've actually made a production error because we what we've suggested does not exist in the world of Hearthstone. So looks like okay, they just went ahead and dealt with the Wrath insert of Air Totem. Impactful spell here. There it is. It's nothing. It's actually already drawn. They drew the evolve. That's the impactful spell. What does production know? A lot, apparently. <laughs> All right, so slam manatide totem. Uh, and I'm thinking you are you are prepping to go this turn. That's tough. Man, that I mean, is... you're, you're going to lose next turn to just the damage on board unless you clear something. Or get a bunch of taunts from, from right, your well, evolve. I, my point is, though, you have to evolve this turn, right? Yeah. Even yeah. if you get taunt totem... Yeah, it's still not enough because you can't clear any of the minions even if you do get taunt on them. So they have to evolve and hope that they land some taunts. And the question is, do they manatide and totem and then evolve? Or do they evolve and then totem manatide to sort of reduce the chances? And I think I like drawing the card next turn. Do they get a taunt? Ooh. They get a taunt? Okay, and they get the armor smith. Wow. Actually, that's a really good outcome. They also get the Colt sorcerer. Or sorry, the Darkshire librarian. That's Darkshire librarian, right? It is Darkshire Librarian. So they get a card draw off of that for free? All right. And that's... Okay, so so all things considered, that is a fairly weak draw, I would think. Yeah. I mean, it, it's... It's not as bad as the quest at right. this stage. It is uh, generating armor, obviously, but I think what Taiwan really wants to just see is the clamps come out. They just want to have a big enough board uh, to where they can either end the game just based off damage, mm -hmm. or there's just no way... Uh, that USA can just get through it, whatever they put down. And uh, the armor smith at 1-4, it's doing stuff, but it's certainly not big. Yeah, the US needs Bulbus next turn because their board is going to be picked apart on Taiwan's following turn. So they need to be able to try and push through and solidify at least some type of position on the board. I mean, at this point, they have no doppelgangsters and they have no evolves left. It's just going to be really hard for them to win. I mean, it's there's a likelihood that they're going to get fatigued, and there it's going to. I mean, it's getting close to a mathematic impossibility for them to win based on the the, the hands at the moment. But yeah, and that's just math. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it may be a little bit tougher considering Taiwan can't even complete the quest. They just don't have enough minions left in the deck, even if they draw it. Those are very two of the. Those are the two best draws, I think, back to back. Bloodlust plus Flame Tongue, they can push through. Yeah, the mats are very important at this point. The Flame Tongue Totem actually doesn't really do much, to be honest. Because you, you put the, uh, the Murloc into the 8 4. You put the uh, uh, Searing Totem into the 2-4, and then you put the Armorsmith into the other Armorsmith. And then Mana Titan would just most likely go face. Uh, I mean, oh, I guess if you, you th they can not use, actually, this is smart. They can only use the Flametown Totem and not use the Bloodlust. So that way, when they build up a big board, Bullets is threatening. So this actually maybe does change their clock. The Flame Totem actually ends up being a bigger draw than the Bloodlust because now they actually have the burst damage threat to potentially close out the game. There's and a taunt that allows the Searing Totem to live. So that's yeah. another body for the Bloodlust. It's actually pretty big. Now, that said, we see that Taiwan still had a lot of health uh, and a brawl just totally blows this board out. Yeah. Oh. I mean, at this point, if you wait, you're just giving them free damage because they can't develop any minions anyway. I guess they're going to try and fatigue. They don't want the Manatai Totem to die, but they could just trade it off. <laughs> this is weird. I mean, do they mathematically win anyway? They have 60 health. If they leave the board full, they would only be taking 
uh, six, seven, eight damage per turn, healing up two. So they take six damage per turn. So they effectively have about nine turns remaining, given their fatigue. Well, the U.S. die in nine turns to their own fatigue. They have two cards left, so seven turns in fatigue they would. But then you have to factor in Bloodlust, which if it's a full board, would be an extra 21 damage. I don't know. Math is hard. I was going to say, the whole time you were talking about that, I was just thinking about dinner. Yeah, and also, I mean, they did that turn in like two seconds. So maybe they were already trying to figure it out. Shreel is I'm hungry. <laughs> I don't know if they went through all the math on that one. I'm, I'm guessing what they did was a, they just kind of landed out, wait and see what happens. Yeah, wait maybe. Wait and see if there's a situation where the, the brawl just is more of the haymaker they want it to be. And they still had a Stonehill Defender. Truly, their bag of tricks is endless. Yeah. And so they do have a second copy of Sea Giant. Hmm. So it looks like they cut one copy of Stonehill Defender and... Maybe a devolve. Yeah, I think we've seen one devolve. And I think when I was talking to Muzzy, that was exactly the cuts he had made as well. Mm -hmm. It was one stone hill and one devolve. So that would uh, make sense. All right, well, there's the bloodlust coming out. Just going to go ahead and get that damage in now. You know, and I think they realized with five cards left, Taiwan, if they don't have the bloodlust now, uh, they, they are going to draw it relatively soon. Going to go ahead and just use the bloodlust to push now. And they do shave off a fair bit of damage. Ooh, get him down to 28. <laughs> Nicely done. Maybe they save the Stonehold Defender until they draw the quest and hope they change Stonehold Defenders to shorten the clock slightly. Actually, they didn't cut a second Stonehold Defender because that's the second one. What is there not two of in this deck? I don't know. They're only pushing seven damage a turn. Okay, I think there was only one copy of Doppelgangster. No, they've used two. Did they? Yeah. I was going to say, that seems ridiculous, but... Yeah, we because we had the Doppelgangster conversation, and then they played the second one later on. Hmm. Taiwan has still yet to draw the quest. Unless we missed it, but I don't think we did. You know, at this point, I just don't think they're going to get it done. I think that's a, a, a fair assessment. Yep. I think they would need to play it and then just chain Stone Hill defenders. They would. Yeah. Beetleberries. <laughs> My favorite. Ah, wrong card. What does Stone Hill defender say? Out of my jungle. Is my swamp donkey. That's egg napper. <laughs> I actually don't know what egg napper says. Beetle eggs. <laughs> my favorite. In a world where, where Hearthstone is a, a much lower budget game. <laughs> it's just beetleberries, except it's... Right, we're going to do another take. We're, we're do another take. Can you say beetle eggs this time? Actually, just say eggs and we'll put it over. <laughs> beetle eggs. <laughs> My favorite. Hey, right, can you just can you also say meh? <laughs> beetle eggs. Meh. Beetle flame tongue totem. No. My favorite. Who says flame tongue totem? The flame tongue totem doesn't even say flame tongue totem when it's played. Oh yeah, it's not, you're right. How does, I was gonna say, how does that work in your head? <laughs> I don't know. I see cards, I say the name. Do you when you when you introduce yourself to people, you just go TJ? <laughs> yes. Well, you are pretty lovable. Aw. All right. Well, <laughs> Axe comes out, and Taiwan's still just uh, refusing to brawl, which I. Does this make this kind of hairy? It does, a little bit. But at this point, I mean, I feel like it's still hard for them to lose because the United States is getting pretty far into fatigue.
but Taiwan is going to hit fatigue as well, but they're going to have armor up, so. That's that slam execute. I mean, they, they could have, I, I suppose they could have done this a long time ago, but it would have allowed the United States to reload with stronger things. They can at least know that there's one thing from below. They can assume there's either a Stonehill to Keeper, Stonehill Defender, or a Sea Giant. Yeah, this this to me feels like a match where you're playing a like dream hack where you just want to know the deck list of your opponent. And you're just like, all right, let's see all the cards. Let's see all the Obviously, that doesn't matter in the Global Games format. It doesn't. Once you've, uh, unless that player is playing in the ace match, but Hot Meowth is not. So they can pretty confidently say that that's not going to happen. I mean, at this point, I still just don't think the, the US is going to be able to get through. Are there any pickups from Stonehill Defender that can potentially. Uh, Alakir would push damage. What about gain life? Um, I don't think so. No. Hot Spring Guardian. Hot Spring Guardian. Yeah, you're right. Good call. But I don't think that's a, a significant amount. Of, no, it's it's not life it's not enough. In order to get through, because this turn I believe they're taking th oh, three points of fatigue. So. I mean, there's both of the cards that we mentioned. And Alakir also Torrent Warrior. Well, all taunts gain you life technically. So everything from Stone Stonehill Defender gains you life. Hot Spring Guardian just actually gains you life. Wow. Yeah, the the free thing from below allows the Sea Giant to come down as well. So America's US, really making that stand. US only Oh, Battle Rage, that's useless. So Quest is useless. Slam is almost useless. And Battle Rage is useless. So they really only have one card left. And <laughs> Actually, United States has three turns, unless face damage comes in. Did Taiwan wait too long? And they're in fatigue, so they're starting to take additional damage. And the Stonehill Defender actually makes it really awkward because they don't have a way to activate the Execute without drawing a card from the Slam. So they can hit the thing from below, take five, Slam to not draw a card, You can actually get through the Stonehill Defender. No, you can't. No, you can with the Maelstrom Portal, and Alec here just hits for six. Did they just lose? Two turns left. Well, they're okay. So from the U.S., they have they have the next turn, and then the fatigue damage will tick for them. Wait, hold on. They can get in face damage with the Sea Giant. It would mean they sacrifice the Alakir because they'd have to attack twice into the Bloodhoof Brave. Jade Claws goes into the Stonehill Defender, Maelstrom Portal, uh, and then you Stonehill Defender to their Stonehill Defender, and then you push for eight. You don't have an activator for the Execute either. Well, yeah, you don't have act that. Yeah, I think that's the right play. You sacrifice yep. the Alakir. Actually, there's a way to do it that's even better this yeah this way because then you don't sacrifice the alakir you hit it into the stonehill defender you still attack face for eight with the sea giant and your alakir is healthy plus you rolled a boar you actually attacked for nine is that oh yeah they rolled a boar so that's just game wow wow that